Welcome to the presentation of the paper on the metal performance bounds for carrier phase positioning in cellular networks. My name is Henk Weimersch and I'm at Chalmers University of Technology in Sweden. This is joint work with Ruhola Amiri from Sharif University and Gonzalo Seco Granados from UAB. Let's start by putting this work into a proper context. The figure here shows on the x-axis different levels of location uncertainty and on the y-axis different deployment areas. The vertical lines show various applications or use cases where the different blo blobs represent different radio technologies. We see that 4G can attain location uncertainty of about 10 meter, 5G can go down to about 1 meter, ultra wideband can operate down to 10 centimeters. The blue blob represents GNSS and it can cover all levels of location uncertainty, but only in a clear outdoor scenario where a sufficient number of satellites are available. Finally, we see the green blob, which represents 6G. We see that 6G should cover extremely challenging use cases with accuracies down to centimeter level. If you want more background on the basics of radio localization and sensing and the enablers to achieve this extreme accuracy in 6G, I refer you to the two communication letters shown here on the right. For each of these two letters, there's a dedicated YouTube video available. Most radio positioning methods rely on time-based measurements. This is shown on the right, where we have a base station and a user device. The base station transmits a pilot signal and this arrives at the user device at a certain time. The time of arrival at the user device, denoted by tau, is equal to the distance between the user and the base station over the speed of light, plus the clock bias of the user. This is because the user is typically not synchronized to the base station at least not sufficiently for, for positioning purposes. And in case there are multiple propagation paths, each of the paths will have their own delay corresponding to the corresponding distance and with the same clock bias. On the left side, we provide a more mathematical view. Suppose we transmit a pilot signal across subcarriers and all of those pilot signals are identical. At the receiver side, we observe a vector across the subcarriers which is a superposition of L paths. Each path has its own complex gain, alpha L, and each path has its own delay, tau L. Finally, there's also the noise. The delay appears as a phase rotation across the subcarriers. Due to this linear phase rotation, the delay can be estimated by taking the FFT of R and looking for peaks. This is shown on the bottom right. In case, this case, there are two paths. And then the receiver can just take the delay corresponding to the first peak, which is, of course, the, in this case, the line of sight path for further processing for positioning. We know that when the delay difference between the two paths is small, the two peaks will blur into each other. This effect is related to the resolution, which is the ability to resolve multi-path components. The resolution, in turn, depends on the bandwidth. The more bandwidth, the better resolution. Notice that in all of this, we did not use the complex channel gain alpha L for positioning. So we discard it after the delay of the line of sight path has been estimated. We can now put together the delay measurements from different base stations. This is done in time difference of arrival positioning, or TDOA. TDOA is the workhorse in 5G, and it operates as follows. Suppose that we have a user transmitting a pilot in uplink, and each of the base stations estimates the time of arrival. Each of these base stations is also linked and synchronized through a central unit. Then the time of arrival at base station I, denoted by tau hat I, is the distance between the I base station and the user, di, over the speed of light, plus the clock bias of the user, plus noise. To get rid of the clock bias, one of the base stations is taken as a reference, say base station 0. We can then compute so-called differential measurements with respect to that reference base station. These differential measurements are differences of distances which no longer depend on the clock bias b. 
Geometrically, the difference of distances determines a hyperbola. So this means that the user must lie on the intersection of several hyperbola. This is shown on the figure on the right, where we have three base stations, which determine two hyperbola, and the user is then in the region determined by the intersection of this hyperbola. The performance of TDOA positioning is limited by the base station placement, as well as the multipath resolution, which is in turn determined by the bandwidth. The limited bandwidth is also the reason why the hyperbola are not very fine, but rather broad shapes on the map on the right. Increases in bandwidth with introduction of 5G millimeter wave has led to several enhancements for positioning in 3GPP since release 16. This includes new methods in uplink and downlink, as well as delay and angle measurements, as well as new signals, which all combined lead to submeter accuracy, provided we have a dense deployment of base stations and they are sufficiently synchronized. The increased focus on positioning has continued in subsequent 3GPP releases. In release 17, there have been enhancements for time and angle measurements, multipath reporting, and delay reduction. In release 18, there has been a focus on sidelink and integrity support, bandwidth aggregation, positioning for reduced capacity or red cap devices, and also carrier phase positioning. And carrier phase positioning will be the main topic for the rest of this presentation. Carrier phase positioning has its background in GNSS, where phase calibrated satellites send signals to terrestrial receivers and also terrestrial reference stations. These receivers compute time of arrival measurements as well as phase measurements, or their differences, depending on the situation. The figure shows an example of carrier phase position, positioning in GNSS, while the figure on the right shows an example of carrier phase positioning in cellular, in a cellular system, which we will focus on today. To make things simple, we will consider that there's only a line of sight pad between each base station and the receiver. This then leads to the following signal model from base station M to the user in downlink. So the signal observed by the user from base station M is a vector across the subcarriers, which comprises the transmit signal power, the channel gain from the M to base station, and the delay steering vector, where the delay appears as a linear phase rotation across the subcarriers and noise. The complex channel gain, of course, has an amplitude and a phase. What we want to do now is we want to exploit this phase information. So to do this, we will relate tau m, the delay, and theta m, the phase, to the position. The time of arrival, as before, is equal to the distance between the m to base station and the user over the speed of light, plus the clock bias of the user, assuming the base stations are time synchronized. The phase of alpha, theta m, is equal also to the distance between the base station, base station and the user, multiplied by two pi over lambda, plus a phase bias, assuming now that the base stations are phase synchronized. The dependence of the phase on the distance can be explained as follows. We realize that when a user moves away or towards a certain base station, every movement, movement of lambda distance corresponds to a 2 pi phase rotation. So now our goal is from observations of the form Y from several base stations to localize the user by using the delay measurements tau m as well as the phase measurements theta m. We note that conventional TDOA positioning just ignores the phase measurements, as we mentioned before. Now, our positioning approach is a standard two-phase approach. We first apply channel parameter estimation for each base, each base station, and then fuse these together to get the location estimate. So let's now look first at the channel parameter estimation. So we apply, we apply a standard estimation technique, such as maximum likelihood, to determine the channel delay and the channel phase. And we rename them now by converting them to distances as y tau m and y theta m. So y tau m is equal to the distance plus the clock bias multiplied now by the speed of light plus measurement noise. Similarly, the observed phase when converted to distance is the distance between the base station and the user 
times the phase bias uh, multiplied by lambda over 2 pi plus noise. But now, since the phase is only determined modulo 2 pi, there's a carrier phase ambiguity, which is an integer, zm, times lambda. Because again, every time the user moves one lambda, the phase will be the same. Let's now look at the differences between those two noises, the noise in the delay measurement and the noise in the phase measurement, when both of them are converted to distances. A simple fissure information analysis will reveal that the measurement variance of the delay measurements is proportional to one over the bandwidth. The variance of the distance estimate from the phase measurements is proportional to one over the square of the carrier. Since the carrier frequency is typically an order of magnitude larger than the bandwidth, this means that the carrier phase measurements provide much more information about the distance than the delay measurements, but they are affected by the ambiguity. So with this, we in principle have estimated the delay and the phase from at each of the base stations. We know how good each of those measurements are, and we can then start by fusing them. So now we fuse the measurements from the different base stations, and we consider two different methods. In the first method, we stack all of the observations in a long vector Y. So this comprises the delay measurements and the phase measurements, converted distances. Uh, we widen these measurements by multiplying with the square root of the channel covariance matrix. And then we try to um, minimize the distance between this widened observation and two different terms. The first term is a nonlinear function of the continuous state, which contains the user position and the biases, and a term that depends on the integer values, which here we converted to differential values to reduce our dimensionality. And then we want to minimize with respect to the user state S and the integer values. And this is a high dimensional mixed integer problem. To solve their problem, we apply a method similar to the one uh, to the lambda method in GNSS, where we take an initial guess of S, we linearize the observation around S, and then we end up with the integer least squares problem in ZD. We then estimate ZD and then refine the state S. In the second method, we avoid the integer ambiguity by modeling the measurement of the carrier phase with a von Mises distribution rather than a Gaussian distribution. And this allows us to write the negative log likelihood function as a sum of two terms. In green is the term related to the, to the delay measurements, and in orange is the term related to the carrier phase measurements. That way, we end up with an objective that only involves continuous variables, and we remove all the integer variables. On the downside, uh, this objective function will be highly nonlinear and non-convex, so it's potentially difficult to find a global optimum with respect to the user position, the user clock bias, and the user phase bias. In order to benchmark the performance of the estimators, we will rely on fundamental performance bounds. We will first consider three classical bounds and then propose a novel bound that accounts for the integer carrier phase ambiguity. These bounds will assume some knowledge of Fisher information theory, which I do not cover in this presentation. We will denote the bounds by sigma and describe them as error covariance. However, you should know that they should be understood as bounds on the error covariance. Let's start with the first bound. The first bound is an optimistic bound, so it will be too low, and assumes that the integer ambiguity is perfectly known, so all the z values are perfectly known. This just leaves the unknown user position, clock bias, and phase bias. So this then determines the state, and the Fisher information of this state can, is given by this expression. From this Fisher information matrix, we can compute its inverse, and then extract the uh, first three by three block diagonal block matrix, and this provides us with a bound on the error covariance of the user position. A second bound will disregard the carrier phase. So we only look at the delay measurements, in that case, the state we want to estimate is the user position and the clock bias. We can compute the Fisher information matrix of this state. It's given by this matrix. We again take the inverse and take the uh, first three by three block matrix. And this provides us with another lower bound on the error covariance if we had only used the delay measurements. We now look at the third classical bound. 
In this case, we um, we include the integer values z, but we would like them to be real values. So this leads to a large dimensional unknown comprising the unknown user position and the clock bias, as well as the relaxed variable z. Note that the phase bias phi u is no longer present because it's absorbed in z. With this unknown, we could compute a very large Fisher information matrix, which is shown with these colored blocks. Okay, to find all of these blocks is relatively straightforward. We can then invert this matrix and apply the matrix inversion lemma to find the different components of the inverse. After some math, it turns out that the bound on the user position, here given by this expression, is the same as delay only positioning. So this means that the carrier phase measurements when we relax the integer ambiguity to real values does not do not bring any information about the user position. We can also find um, error covariance bound on z, the relaxed z, given by this expression. So this is how well we can estimate z if it was a real value and not integer. So these are all our classical bounds. Um, it turns out, as we will see later, that these are not very useful bounds in the sense that they are not very tight. So this motivates looking at a more um, useful bound. The proposed bound is quite involved and involves five distinct steps. In the first step, we remove the non-identifiable parameters by considering differential integer values. This is because the phase bias and the integer values are not jointly identifiable. So we consider the stacked observation of all the delay measurements and all the carrier phase measurements converted to distances. So this is a vector y of length 2m, which contains all of these measurements. We can express this vector as a sum of four terms. The first term is a nonlinear function of the position. So it contains the distances and the clock bias, the first component of this f tilde relates to the delay measurements, and the second part of the, this uh, uh, f tilde refers to the carrier phase measurements. Then we have all the integer values, so m of the integer values, these are these zms, multiplied by a tall matrix b. And the top part of this matrix is all zeros, and the bottom part of this matrix is lambda times an identity matrix. Then we have the... Um, the phase ambiguity, phi, which we here multiply, divided by two pi, we call kappa. Again, multiply by the stall matrix B and all one vector. This is because this kappa or phi appears in all of the measurements uh, equally, plus noise. And this noise is modeled as a Gaussian with a covariance matrix depending on the quality of the measurements W tau M and W theta M, captured by this block diagonal matrix. Now, since z and kappa, or z and phi, are not jointly identifiable, we will convert them. So we do this as follows. So we take this part here, b times z and kappa b times one. And what we do is we rewrite it as the sum of two parts where we move z1, so the first entry in z, inside kappa. Okay, so then z will have as first entry zero, and all then these ZD will be differential measurements, so where we take the previous Z and we remove Z1, and then the Z1 is moved to kappa. So we haven't changed anything, but we've removed one integer value, and we converted one of the integer values and merged it into a real value. So this is still a real valued parameter. And then we can plot this back into this expression, and we end up with uh, some simple manipulations as having the same observation y, exactly the same as before. Now with a new function here, f of s, which is the old function f tilde of s tilde, where s tilde is the user position and the clock bias. We take the continuous value kappa d and put it as part of f of s, so that's this one. And then we have this b times zero and zd, and we can manipulate this with some simple linear algebra into b times e times zd, plus noise. And now we have zd integer value, so we have m minus one integer values, zd, so these are the differential integer values, but there's m minus one of them. And then we have here the three-dimensional user position, the clock bias, and the phase bias. And now it turns out that we have enough information to estimate all of these jointly. In the second step, we use our classical bound number three, 
Recall that this classical bound told us how well we could estimate the vector z if it was unconstrained, so if it could take on any real value. And this was sigma onc. Given the relation between zd and z, we can also compute a bound on how well we can estimate zd if it was unconstrained. And that's this matrix S. So this is the error covariance on zd if it was unconstrained. From this error covariance, we can generate many samples ri of the unconstrained and whitened zd. And for each of those samples ri, we can solve a small integer program to get a constraint estimate of zd. With this estimate corresponds a certain bias, of course, delta i, which tells us how far off we are from the true zd. Hence, through this process, by generating many samples ri from this corresponding density, we end up with a list of um, different integer values, zd, that a practical estimator could plausibly generate with corresponding biases. In the third step, we consider this bias and then compute the corresponding bias in the state S. So after some math and some approximations, we find that due to the bias in the integer part, the amount delta, this leads to a bias in the state itself B of this extent. In step four, for the same bias, we use results from biased estimation theory to compute a bound on the error covariance of S given the current bias. Okay, and we see that there's a first term, which is the bias itself multiplied by its transpose. It's really just the bias term. And then the error covariance, assuming known integer values with these correction terms, which are these uh, gradients of the bias. Finally, we average the error covariance over all possible values the bias of the integer value can take. So this is done using a Monte Carlo simulation. This means also that the quality of our bounds, which is here sigma mi for mixed integer bound on S, depends on the number of samples that we generate. It also means that the bound is relatively intense to compute because for each sample ns, we need to compute delta i, and this computation of delta i recall, recall requires solving a small uh, integer problem. Let's now look at some simulation results. We will consider a user at a height of five meters surrounded by base stations. We'll have a nominal carrier frequency of 28 gigahertz with 60 megahertz of bandwidth and 13 dB transmit power and seven base stations. And all of these parameters will be varied later on. We will compare three estimators, um, the standard estimator, which only considers delay estimates, the mixed integer approach, where we start from a TDOA estimate, so from the standard estimate, and then a directional statistics approach with the Volmeises density, um, which will rely on a fine grid to, to have uh, the final estimate. We will then also compare with three bounds, um, these are called position error bound, which is derived from the inverse of the Fisher information matrix and is expressed in meter. The first is the bound based only on the delay estimates. The second bound is based on the delay and carrier phase estimates, but assumes known ambiguity. So all the Zs are known. And then the final bound is the proposed bound. And all, again, all of these bounds are expressed in meters. We will first look at the impact of the carrier frequency shown on the x-axis uh, on the performance shown on the y-axis in meters. The blue line shows the case without carrier phase information, so only delay measurements. And in that case, the bound and the algorithm coincide. We see that the performance degrades with larger, larger carrier frequencies because of increased path loss. The black dashed line is the position error bound when the integer values are known. In this case, the curve is flat because of two, two counteracting effects. On the one hand, the path loss increases with frequency, and on the other hand, the carrier frequency itself increases. And both effects cancel out in the quality of the carrier phase measurements, which dominate the performance. The black full line shows the performance of the mixed integer approach. We see that it touches the bound for low carrier frequencies, but then deviates and increases to approximately the level of the delay-only positioning performance. A similar trend holds true for the directional statistics approach in red, but the transition occurs for higher frequencies. <laughs>
The performance improvement between the black and the red core curve comes at a cost of increased complexity. The new bound we proposed in the dash red shows that it shows to quite well match the performance of the directional statistics approach. So this bound is more useful than the uh, black dashed bound. To understand the behavior at different carry frequencies, it is instructive to look at the log likelihood function for let's say 3 and 30 gigahertz. At 3 gigahertz, we show here the, the log likelihood functions as a function of one of the coordinates, the x coordinate, where the true location of the user is at zero. The delay only likelihood function has a peak that is close to zero and this peak is broad. The likelihood function with carry phase measurements has a much narrower peak, which is much closer to the true location. It is intuitive that from the optimum of the blue curve, a local search can find the optimum of the red curve. At 30 GHz, the situation is completely different. The delay only likelihood function is much broader and has a peak much further away from the true position due to the increased path loss. So that means the initial estimate will be poor. The carrier phase log likelihood function in red has a global optimum at the true location but this optimum is very narrow and there are many additional locations with a very similar log likelihood function, log likelihood value. This means, this means that uh, finding the global peak is like finding a needle in a haystack. And this, turns, uh, this in turn causes degradation of the estimators and makes the proposed bound tighter at higher frequencies. So we see this degradation at these higher frequencies predicted by the proposed bound. When we look at a function of bandwidth, a similar story emerges. The delay only RMSC in blue and the bound decrease with bandwidth as expected. The classical bound with known integer value is flat. When the delay only estimates become good enough, the mixed integer approach can attain the bound. And the proposed bound attains, uh, can track the, the performance of the practical estimators rather well. We see in the conclusion that at high care frequencies, in this case at 28 gigahertz, we need a sufficient amount of bandwidth, in this case around uh, 40 megahertz, for the carrier phase positioning to work. If the bandwidth is too low, we have no hope for making the carrier phase positioning to work. Next, we will change the transmission power. Now a different story emerges. All of the classical bounds improve with more transmission power, of course, leading to roughly parallel lines. The proposed bound has a thresholding behavior, which is very different. We see that for a sufficiently large transmission power, a more global optimum of the carry phase estimate leads us to correctly identify the correct optimum. So this causes this phase transition effect. In this case, the mixed integer approach fails to perform, even at larger transmit powers. This is because we linearize around the two poor position estimates from the delay only measurements, no matter what the transmission power is here. On the other hand, the directional statistics approach in red can follow the, the proposed bound rather well. So in this case, we really see the difference between the two algorithms and the need for having a more sophisticated approach than the classical mixed integer approach. Finally, we consider the effect of the number of base stations surrounding the user. And this is, for instance, interesting in a D-MIME or cell-free scenario. We see that the classical bounds are relatively flat since, the since they are dominated by the best few base stations around the user. The mixed integer approach again suffers from the poor initialization from the delay-only estimate. The proposed bound indicates that after about 10 base stations we should get good performance. And this is corroborated by the estimator, which after 11 base stations can get uh, attain the lower bound corresponding to known ambiguities. This leads us to our conclusion. So we have seen that in cellular positioning, carrier phase measurements are informative but have an ambiguity which should be properly accounted for. The ambiguity means that we need different methods than for classical delay-only positioning, which come at the cost of increased complexity. We saw that the most powerful methods can benefit from more bandwidth, lower carrier frequencies and more base stations, but less so from increased transmit power, which is surprising. We've also shown that classical bounds fail to predict the performance of the estimators. And to address this, we have introduced a novel bound, which is more accurate, but its, it's self is also more 
computationally intensive. Thank you for your attention.